Hello everyone, this is Dr. Bob Browner with uh, Community Coronavirus Update number 34. Today we'll talk uh, more about the ethical dilemma of opening schools, a tale of multiple Nebraska cities, and a little hope at the end. So uh, schools across the state are faced with uh, unfortunately a terrible ethical dilemma. Uh, we, we have to balance essentially the education and well-being of chil school children versus the health of parents, grandparents, teachers, and school staff. Uh, the good news for children is that their risk for uh, serious consequences or death from coronavirus are extremely small, uh, probably equivalent to influenza or maybe even less. Uh, we have had one fatality in Nebraska. That was a child who had uh, triple uh, uh, organ transplant, so a high-risk kid who wouldn't be at school anyway uh, during this pandemic. So if you have a serious health condition, you should you be opting out. So by having kids at school come to school, we're not risking the health of those children for the most part. Some of them will get sick, uh, probably, but the likelihood of any fatalities are far lower than pretty much anything else that they're at risk of, whether it be influenza, car wrecks, child abuse, or whatever. So the main reason we're doing all these things that will be coming some obstacles to their education are to protect the health of parents, uh, grandparents, teachers, and school staff. So it puts us in a weird place. We're usually talking about doing sacrificing for our children. We're actually act, acting, asking our children to sacrifice for the rest of us, which puts us in a really weird spot. Now, we shouldn't have to be in this position, but that's where we are. Um, this uh, great article from World Wa Opinion Piece from Wall Street Journal article uh, journal, not exactly your most uh, liberal group, pretty conservative paper written by a pretty conservative group of guys, Gottlieb and Strain from the American Enterprise Institute, that said the problem is we didn't do what we needed to do to get our uh, schools to open more safely. Our basically our federal and government and, and state governments failed us. They should have gotten the epidemic under control, but they did not, and they didn't do it because they were worried about opening bars and tattoo parlors, our, our non-essential businesses, uh, and so that's just a, I don't know what to say about that, that that became the decision that they were a higher priority than opening our schools safely. But they do talk about that there are serious consequences of not sending our children to school. The social and educational losses are, are enormous, uh, and some of the, the losses that can, can accumulate over a lifetime. So an economist estimates that one year of schooling can, can change your wages by 9%, and that accumulates over an entire life. And also that virtual learning is especially hard on low-income children. So we need to find a way to get most of those kids to school while also balancing the health of the community. So this is a terrible position to be put in, but we're, whether we like it or not, this is the position we're in. Uh, and so I know this guy probably wants to keep his business open, but I'm sorry, but the children are more important as well as their families. That's health is more important than one business. So ideally, we would have done what Italy did. They learned the hard way, just like we learned the hard way with New York. Uh, well, actually, we didn't learn. We didn't do anything, get anything to control our epidemic like they did. So a lot of countries like Italy and Spain, France have gotten their numbers down to where they end. So it's easier for them to open the schools safely. We're stuck in this middle area uh, between a rock and a hard space. And at Nebraska level, uh, we're kind of in the middle. We, we, you know, New York learned its lessons, got its way down. A lot of good, a lot of states didn't have to learn the hard way. Vermont, uh, Maine, New Hampshire, a lot of states are actually messing up just as bad or worse than New York. Nebraska, we're kind of middle of the road. We didn't, we had, we were on a good trajectory, opened too soon with a bad plan and didn't react soon enough. So unfortunately, we're sort of stuck in this limbo area. Uh, and some of you know there's a K-12 through report by UNMPC that I was part of creating, although I was a minor entity, but still I think people are sort of getting wrong what's happening. We're, we're getting a convergence of, of several ideas of what is safe versus not safe in schools. And so this was set up by looking at uh, essentially like if you're in the education world, there's something called criterion reference versus norm reference. You look at the criteria, what would be we know is good. And in this case, uh, what they did is they looked at a, a snapshot of 15 countries and said, when did they open successfully? 13 out of 15 opened successfully here, but one opened here and actually one did open here. So it's not an absolute that you have to be less than five, five for 100,000 or 50 for 100,000 because one school did open safely here. The question is, do we have anything in common with them so that we could say, well, maybe because we don't meet that, we're still okay. Also, of course, there's a whole other set of uh, criteria put out by the Harvard Saffer group that is, has more lax measures than this. So there are competing measures, both of which I think you can make a good argument for, but all of them has to be, be put together on a local level, what's happening in your community. And people keep forgetting what, what's happening in Lincoln is not the same thing that's happening in Des Moines or Kansas City or Tulsa, Oklahoma. So, and of course, we're not going to get wrong what, we, what I talked about last time. We talked about how Israel did pretty much everything wrong, which resulted, even though they had things under control, got out of control because they essentially did everything wrong. They had no organized plan, mass requirement, any of this stuff. We have all of this stuff in place. So we're not going to do the Israel thing. Uh, so I'm not worried about that. 
Um, there's a good Kaiser Family Foundation report that I've linked to, so remember if you click to uh, view page and go to the notes, you can actually pull up the links to every article, see so if you do more reading yourself. Uh, but they only used uh, the 14 uh, studies uh, of countries that opened successfully uh, in this range. They didn't include anything about Singapore, and they didn't talk about Sweden, so there's a little bit of a selective reading of the evidence there. So the question is, do we have any commonalities with Singapore and Sweden so that we could open successfully? And I actually think we do. Um, one uh, really good uh, podcast uh, about Sweden actually is Josh Sharfstein from Johns Hopkins interviews Anders Tegnell, the chief epidemiologist of Sweden, and asked them about why did they do what they did. Uh, he was actually, I thought, uh, was very uh, frank about what they got wrong and what they got right. And they did get some things wrong, which he fully admitted, one of which is they didn't protect their nursing homes well enough. And if you look at their mortality data, uh, the other thing is I'd point out that where Sweden is right now, that they did open successfully, that's kind of where we are right now. So if we do a Singapore-Swedish approach, I think we can open our schools safely. The other thing um, is, is the trend over time. And so it's not just where you are now, but what direction you're going. So here in Lancaster County, uh, we've been putting these tableau sites out here. Uh, we actually have no one with no colors now. And this was, uh, so what we've been doing is that based on what people are asking us to do, we have, if you go to our tableau site at healthynebraska.org, you'll see one with the UNMC thresholds for colors. You'll see some with the Harvard thresholds for colors. You'll see some with no colors. And actually a school superintendent asked us to create this because what he was noting is that as soon as you put a color on there, people looked at the color and they quit thinking. And so you couldn't have a discussion anymore. So if you want to talk about the numbers first and then talk about the colors, this is better because then people will at least stop long enough to think and understand. And so are we at a safe level? Well, what Singapore did is they opened around a seven to eight range, which is about here. They had a downward trend. They knew where their cases were coming from. When Lincoln, we have a downward trend. And if, if our mask ordinance was put in place here, it started taking effect. It might have us give us that downward trend such that we'll be like Singapore. Plus, we know exactly where our cases from coming out. From. It's coming from 20 to 29 year old people going to bars and house parties. So as we crack down on those bars and house parties and, and we have those mask ordinances in place, there's a good shot that we can get this lower and make it safe to open our schools and we can do the Singapore thing uh, even though we're not in an ideal situation right now. So that's why one reason I think it's safe in Lincoln. The other thing is risk mitigation. So there's a there's there's a gray area. There's what we know is safe, there's what we know is not safe, and there's an in-between. And I think actually we're in that area. As we learn and get more information, I think we put in enough things, at least in Lincoln, that I feel comfortable with this. So one, we do have a community mask ordinance in our community, unlike Omaha. Uh, we also have a trend in a favorable direction, unlike Omaha and Kearney, which I'll get into in a minute. We have universal masking in school, and it's going to be very stringent. We also have reduced numbers already. So we had 17% opt-in remote for K-8, through so automatically in our elementary and middle schools we'll have a lower uh, crowding of schools, and not a single middle school will be at capacity with a range of anywhere from 55 to 80 percent, 88 percent. However, in high school, we had five of our six schools were over capacity starting, and that's why we have our school bond. So high school, we were unable to keep, get anywhere near there. That's why I think it, we did the right thing and chose a 3-2 high school uh, format. That'll actually keep our high school capacity at about less than 50 percent as we start this out. All parents have the choice of remote learning, so if you have a child with any health condition or a family with health condition, you can do remote learning. And a pretty large number of people did opt for that, which is good. We gave them the choice to select their own risk category, basically. And of course, we're doing other things, hand washing and indoor air quality. So one thing we have over, say, Kansas City, for example, is we uh, our school buildings are in great shape because of our indoor air quality projects. We have three air changes per hour, so if there's any aerosol spread, that's going to help limit that. So we have a lot of things to mitigate that risk. And so there's, uh, like we often say in public health, it's often late layers of Swiss cheese, you get enough layers, you'll do okay. And we have many layers of Swiss cheese that we're putting together to make it safer. And like always, I keep telling people we can change any week. So we could open for two weeks, get everybody on track, find out that, well, maybe things aren't working and go remote. We can make that decision at any time. And honestly, I would tell you plan on that because there's a high likelihood that's going to happen at some point this fall. And it could happen more than once, actually. Uh, my biggest worry is what's going to happen when UNL comes back. And if they do any sporting events, that's actually what could tip us back into all remote. It might not be because of the community or the schools, Lincoln Public Schools, it could be the university example. So now once you've thought about this and understand that we have put on our Tableau site all four versions and one just absolute numbers because the power district says, you know, we want to know how many people. So you can look at all of these one, depending on what your flavor is, what your use is. The value to this Tableau site is you can put counties together. So Douglas and Sarpy County are, co are two separate health departments, but one city, Omaha. It'd be nice to look at the two combined because epidemiologically they should be, I think. And so it gives you the option to do that. Uh, basically this middle one, this is pretty close to what our counties are using for their risk styles is based on the Johns Hopkins and Harvard Saffer group. So if you want to look at what your county is probably going to use for its wrist style, then click on this one. If you want to use the UNMC one, then click on this one, your choice. 
Uh, if you want to know uh, a real time, another good short site is the COVID Act Now, because you can click on any state or county in the country. It gives you not only that daily infection rate, which is the most important thing, but also your current uh, uh, transmission R level and your positive test rate and some other things. And of course, they do point out, which I think you should, if you're interested, key, click on this key new indicator, which is this. The daily new case is still the most important thing to track. What that tells you is your absolute risk by walking out the front door. How likely are you to run into somebody? So that's a good metric to take. Uh, you, if you want to, you can do the math and back into it. So like at our high school graduation, chances are uh, at that Pinnacle Bank arena, there were four or five people with coronavirus in that arena. And chances are when I was holding, handing out diplomas, at least one of those kids who walked by me had coronavirus based on those numbers. Now, was I concerned? Maybe a little bit, but both of us were wearing masks and doing the right thing. So I wasn't worried about doing it. So it gives you some sense of what your risk is. So next, a tale of four cities. So uh, we've had four cities here, all with very different experiences. So Grand Island Hall County had the huge JBS outbreak. Uh, for scale, I had to, we actually chopped this off. It goes twice as big as this. Uh, they were actually up at 100 per 100,000, which is which was worse than all any worse country right now. Their number their numbers were that bad, actually. I wish they would do an antibody study to see how close they are to herd immunity. That would really be useful. New York did that. I wish we would do that. But since then, they have really done a good job of getting their numbers down and mostly into control. And these are kind of sporadic uh, cases of only a couple because it's a very fairly low so per hundred thousand that's you know probably uh, you know five to ten cases for example they're doing a pretty good job I think they learned the hard way unfortunately but I think Hall County is doing a great job Buffalo County which is Kearney Nebraska they were kind of stuck in the middle they had two outbreaks one to the west one to the east kept it most under control but now they're having a huge upswing and most of these uh, from what I hear from talking to folks I know there it's coming from things like weddings and uh, and uh, you know, gatherings and parties and things like that. And so it's these social gatherings where people are getting together and not wearing masks. That's driving this uh, drive in Kearney. Uh, Lancaster County, you know, we did a great job. Like I said before, we, we had the spillover from the uh, Smithfield plant in Crete, got under control. But what really makes me angry is we started doing our phased openings by the governor and he watched that number go up and didn't do anything. Uh, we got to the point where our numbers had tripled. Still, he didn't make a, uh, any move to do anything. I don't know how that's an evidence-based policy uh, driver, uh, but thankfully our mayor and our health department director, Pat Lopez and Mayor Lerner Gary Baird put in a mass mandate. It appears that it is leveled off and it appears that we are now dropping. So we've done the right thing. Douglas and Sarpy County, never, they've been smoldering along the whole time. They never got down to yellow. Now they're up here and they still don't have a mask ordinance because the governor won't, doesn't seem to want to let them have it. Uh, I feel far, sorry for the folks out there. I hope they can figure something out to get their numbers trend in the right way because if they go down here, I think they do need to be all remote in that community. So last thing I want to talk, I keep getting these things, are deaths exaggerated? Well, there's some mistakes in the, well, of course, there's always mistakes in death certificates, unfortunately. Uh, we've known that for a long time, but just because there's mistakes doesn't mean the numbers are wrong. And it turns out that based on this Journal of American Medical Study, if anything, our estimates are an underestimate, not an overestimate. So yes, there were some mistakes. Yes, some of you people, quote, died with coronavirus, not of. Uh, but still, overall, the death rate is actually probably 28% higher, not lower. So yes, there are mistakes, but it's not in the right direction you think it is. The way we sort this out in, in public health is excess deaths over a population. So you can go to the CDC's site, and the link is on the on the notes section again. You can see that this is a typical influenza outbreak in the United States. You see a couple little blips there. This is so far. You'll notice that this isn't even close. This is far. This is almost. This is mostly the New York, New Jersey. You're starting to see nationally the uptick from Arizona and Texas, for example. So New York had this huge outbreak. It got to the point that there were more people dying from coronavirus than all other causes of death combined when Newark was at its worst. But they've mostly got under control with a little bit of a blip here. Uh, unfortunately, to the south, they didn't learn from New. York. So you've got uh, Arizona, whose numbers are on the way up, and as well as Texas, whose numbers are on the way up. And this lag, so most people keep don't seem to remember that the fatalities are a month after your numbers start going up. So their numbers are still on the rise, and they're going to keep going up. So it's likely that Arizona will hit a point where they'll have more deaths from coronavirus than all other deaths combined, too. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't learn their lesson. Now, mortality data is changing over time, and so uh, one the, the guess has been somewhere between 0.5 and 1.5% for the infection fatality rate, which is a key number. Uh, if you want to read more about it, there's a study here. Uh, numbers are dropping a little bit on current estimates, that it's actually maybe lower than 1%, which is good. That's a good sign, but one thing I would point out to people is the change over time might be because we're doing good things, meaning our doctors and nurses are learning how to treat this, we're coming up with new medications, and we can make this number keep going lower because we get better. If this had been struck 100 years ago, the infection fatality rate for this would have been up in the 5%, just as bad as Spanish influenza. It's because we have better medical care now. 
And so if you look at some of the newest studies uh, coming out that uh, with dexamethasone and other things, we're getting ICU mortality down from 70% to the to 30% range. And uh, another interesting thing, like I talked about last time, uh, is that convalescent serum may work. And one person pointed out to me here in Lincoln, one of our hospitalists, that you know, if you look at Lincoln's infection fatality, we're one of the lowest. Well, it just so happens that Bryan Health is one of the intervention sites for uh, COVID pl uh, plasma. And so there's a chance that it actually works. And so we could drive that even lower. So I do think there is some hope on the horizon that we have a number of things that could drive our mortality rate even lower, even before we get a vaccine. So anyway, hopefully this is all helpful for you. The summary, this is where I work. Disclaimer, this isn't necessarily the opinions of the folks I work with, uh, but hopefully this helps you uh, understand what's going on a little better.